What I'd like to do is walk you around some of the issues that relate, and I say around the block, and people don't even use that term probably anymore, but, but I do. Um, well, I want to talk to you about some of the things that I think are important about what's happening here. And if you came today for me to give you an absolute cookbook approach on how to do it, the three tiers, I'm going to tell you that's not a very productive way of doing it. I've practiced for a long time, and if I give you everything you need without any work on your part, you don't really appreciate it. And so there's going to be some work. I promise you that the materials that I have here will give you everything you need to understand the different levels of the tiers and all the implications for that. But you're going to have to do some work for that. And if you turn to the index on page one, I'd like to cover some of the things that I think are important for us to share. Now I assume that all of you are practitioners or you're familiar with the concept of response to instruction. And in, in case you are or not, the good news is that nobody in the real world calls it that anymore. It's MTSS, uh, excuse me, multi-tiered levels of systems of support. So RTI is kind of out the door. But I'm going to give you a little history about this. I want to share some things to you. First of all, introduction, what I call a modernization and improvement of work along time coming and I'll explain what that might mean for those of you that are pretty young to the system. Number two, how do you, how do you lead to change? What are the things that we can do and how come we haven't been very successful? I've been doing this for 41 years and I will say to you that um, we started out in a way that most of you are today would not even believe in terms of how we service. There was a time where just getting kids with special needs into school was the goal wasn't about what we were going to do with them once we were there. It was about just getting them into the school environment. But I'm going to talk about some of the inventory of efforts that we have made regarding this process. Number three, we're going to talk about RTI or MTSS and the teacher effect and all the dynamics that are related to the thinking to this process. And then I'm going to give you what I call solution focus. This is based on a model. There's a term called solution focused therapy and I took those concepts and adapted it to administrative. So I call it solution focused management. Ways for us to look at how we could balance this new uh, movement that we have. And as you're going to see, this actually isn't new. And then I'm going to talk about the art of partnering, partnering or what I call a collaborative effect. Okay, let's talk about the modernization and improvement of our work. There's been a call for a change and one welcome and long overdue. How children are taught. We now know that if you don't know the alphabetic principle by the time you come to school, that's not a good sign. We also know that if you're expelled from the chicken little preschool camp at the age of two and a half years of age, that's not a good developmental sign. We now know that you don't wait. Early intervention is something that everybody talks about. It's a term that we use loosely because early intervention and prevention has no money. Why? Because if you prevent a problem from occurring, people don't think you have a problem. So getting people to understand there's certain things you can do to redirect that instructional tr and behavioral tra uh, trajectory, you have to have them buy in that you're stopping something from happening that they don't even know about. It's called predictive validity, the ability for us to say, what might this kid look like when they're in third grade if we don't do something now? We know that 77% of the children that don't learn to read by the time they're th in third grade doesn't mean they can't learn to read, but we know that they won't read fluently enough to comprehend what it is that they need to comprehend. Reading, as it's been very clearly pointed out in much research, is not about decoding. It's about comprehension. 1% decoding, 99% comprehension. The idea is that reading is about understanding something. So how children are taught, we are on the cusp of something different. Number two, how teachers are prepared. We now recognize that we need to do something different about how classroom teachers are prepared. What's the difference between a teacher and a musician or an athlete? Well, to get good at it, all of those things, you have to practice. Isn't that right? But what's the difference? We practice on kids. Think about your first year. Ever wish you could have that back? <laughs> Think about the dynamics. And the idea simply is, is we get good at what we're doing by practicing. And unfortunately, we practice on kids. And we have to recognize that we need to prepare teachers a little bit differently. We need to put you in the down and dirty and in the mud so you see what it is. You need to do the scut work. You need to empty the baskets. You've got to mop the floor so you understand the dynamics of what kids need in order to be successful. And we're starting to recognize that. We're starting to realize that we have some things we can give classroom teachers that are far more meaningful in the real world. Anybody here remembers when they came out of school and they had that first group of kids in front of them, you didn't have a clue about what you were supposed to do. And worst of all, you thought everybody else knew what they were doing. But here's the good news, they didn't. 
They just hit it better than you. And the key here is we changed that dynamic and we were all the better for it. Number three, how children are identified for special services. As I told the group earlier, when I started, there was one disability category. We went up to 13. I'm in the process of finalizing a rating scale that will identify normal children. Going to make me a billionaire. The reality is we're so in love with categories, we've forgotten what's important. It's the criteria. It's what you want to teach. Isn't that right? What is important for kids to know, whether it's the common core, whatever the dynamics, you got to have the criteria. Think about this. Nobody in this room, if they were going to teach their own children how to drive a car, would say, you know, you're never going to have to learn how to make a left-hand turn. We don't leave things out, do we? The point is, in education, we do. We leave things out and think that the kid is going to be able to make it. We now know that we need to change the way we identify children with special needs, and more importantly, what we can do to preempt the problem they're going to experience. Number four, how research is going to be used for informing instruction and behavior. And I want to tell you, is there anybody, are there any professors or researchers in this room today? Okay, great. One of the things that I think is interesting is we talk about value-added research, or we talk about the research, but you know, we don't really read it. Let me give you a concrete example. I've written a lot of materials. How many people in here have ever read any of my work? That really pisses me off. <laughs> but it's not uncommon. And it just really, I spend all that time writing. I just finished one on functional behavioral assessment. I say to myself, well, who's going to read this crap? You know, <laughs> nobody is. I put all this time into it. It's good stuff, and nobody reads it. And I finally realized why. I was in Minneapolis airport, and as I told the group before, I fly quite a bit. I take my vacation time to do this consulting, but I am a, a connoisseur of people. I like to watch people, see how they act and do things. And, and I've struggled with this whole research thing, because we always talk, we're going to use evidence-based practice, we're going to use research. Isn't that right? But turns out that teachers do something for a day or two and then if they don't like it they stop doing it but they tell you they're still doing it what's wrong with that picture you know what I mean well I had an epiphany have you ever had one of these things about research and I found out that it's the way I've written my work that's wrong instead of going into a journal article learning disabilities or something like that I've got to find something that's more user friendly in Minneapolis airport, I got a 10-hour layover because I got canceled. This was a number of years ago. And I walk into a bookstore, and all of a sudden, I see this magazine roll. And there's magazines in there that have all these enticing titles that make you want to buy their magazine. Are you, know, are you following me on this? Okay, let me give you a couple examples, and you'll see where I'm going to go with this. I didn't know this. Expert advice, actual cover headline. Bon Appetit. Anybody ever heard of Bon Appetit? Okay, I don't know where I've been, but I never have. Okay, it's about cooking and baking or something like that, okay? They have a title, and this is what they do. They give you a title that kind of sucks you in at first, but it's $7.95, so you're not sucked in just by the title. There's got to be a subtitle to really hook you. So here's the title that makes you look at it. Build a better biscuit, it says. Hmm. Do I want to build a better biscuit? No, I don't think I do. But then they put in parentheses and usually color, and this is what sucks you in. Hint, they say, it's in the cheddar. That means I can build a better biscuit by adding cheddar. Do you see where I'm following on this? Let, you see, let me keep going here. 17, and you believe this, 17 magazine for young girls. Anybody read that? I'm not making these titles up. This one, 875 ways to look beautiful. Can I be frank for just a minute? If you need that many, you're in trouble. <laughs> you know what I'm, I'm talking about? Okay. Here's one for maturity for people my age. Let's feed the bears, it says. So you're kind of sucked into it. And then it says, when idiots hear the call of the wild. Obviously not a good plan. <laughs> Glamour magazine should have been in a brown paper wrapper when I was a young man. 25 sexy secrets of men's bodies. 25 of them. Really? <laughs> I mean, I can think of one or two. <clears throat> I'm writing these down on a piece of paper and the guy says to me, are you going to buy one of these books? I said, no, I'm doing research here. <laughs> Action research. Cosmopolitan. How many people have ever read Cosmopolitan or seen it? Oh my goodness gracious. Here's a headline. I'm not making this up. True story. Go to, the, go to look at this stuff. 40 girly moves that make boys melt. 40. Here's a little practice hint. Show up. <laughs> Cosmopolitan. 
His secret pleasure zone map included. Hey, if you need a map. I mean, we'd all agree there's something wrong with that. But why am I telling you this? You buy this crap and you believe it. And I write an article that I spend hundreds of hours writing and you don't ever read it. And even if you do read it, you think, nah, I don't think so. Turns out people defend the methodology they know the least about. Isn't that ironic? So from now on, I'm going to write all of my articles and bon appetit, build a better biscuit and at the same time learn to differentiate your curriculum. You see what I mean? Something, something like that. Hint, it's in the way you provide, present the criteria or whatever it might be. Don't you find this odd? Well, the point is research. Let's be bold here. It's not just about understanding research. It's about the applicability and the practice. And the final thing about the call for change is really building productive relationships. Isn't that true? Honestly, special education and regular ed and kids with different needs have been on parallel paths for a long time and we're finally starting to recognize maybe that's not so helpful. But I will tell you this, we could never be where we are today if we hadn't done all those things in the past because we needed to prove that they didn't make any sense. The cascade model we know was the digging of educational graves for many kids in special ed education. We need to change that. There's a, a dilemma between regular ed and special ed and we need to find that balance. Turn, if you will, to page four. I want to show you some of the fads that have gone through the process that in order to get to where we are, you got to believe this. Mainstreaming, you know, opportunities for students with disabilities. That was a big term in 1970. How about the REI initiative in the 80s or inclusive education in the 90s? They've all come and gone. Take a look, if you will, at the top of page five. RTI, a blueprint for change. As I told the group this morning, I'd like you to do something with me. I want you to read this silently as I read this. Listen to this. You read out silently while I read it out loud. We should try to keep and structurally marginalized children in the mainstream of education with special educators serving as a diagnostic clinical remedial resource itinerant and or team teachers, consultants and developers instructional materials with prescription for effective teaching. Sounds good, doesn't it? Then it says the first step would be to make a study of the child to find what behaviors instructional or academic have been acquired along a dimension being considered. That is, what is the criteria you will be teaching them and where do they fall on that continuum? Samples of a sequential program could be designed to move forward from that point. That is, we're no longer interested in why the kid got to where they are. What we're interested in is where they are on that line and how are we going to move them forward. If you don't know how to make a left turn, you teach them how to make a left turn. They don't know how to decode or they don't know the phonemic awareness principles, you teach them those things. Very different, okay? Don't blame the child, don't blame the teacher. The instructional program becomes the diagnostic device. Progress monitoring, see those words floating around? Failures are program and instructor failures, not pupil failures. Sounds good, doesn't it? RTI, nope. Prescriptive teaching from Mackey, 1967 and 1968. How many years ago is that? 40 years ago, this language was on the table. We could have done these things 40 years ago. Problem solving, first conceptualized by John Bergen in an educational environment in 1970. There's a great word called jamais vu, an eerie feeling that we've never been in this situation before, even though we have. Why did it take us so long to get to where we are at this point in time? What had to happen? Why did it have to go this way? Well, let's talk about what leads to change. The inventory of efforts of changing what teachers do in the classroom staggers people. If you take a look at the research, you would just be amazed at all the things we've tried and thought were going to be the answers. And every one of you are living a couple of them right now. Reformers, however, have seldom asked the right question. Instead, they jump to how should teachers teach? Asking the wrong question first leads to a succession of disappointments in classroom reform and the inaccurate conclusion that you, intransient teachers, are to blame. Asking a different and a more fundamental question is critical here, leads to a very different analysis. Which innovations have been embraced or rejected and why? What are the implications of the proposed changes for the classroom and schools? What works? Identifying what matters and building on what works. Isn't that intriguing? We've known, as I told the group earlier, school discipline, suspension. We've known for a long time that school suspension is not appropriate. We knew that President Clinton sent, signed the zero reject law that was a bad idea. And now we're finally getting people to say it's a bad idea. Do you see what I mean? Why does it take so long to take an idea that everybody knows is bad and not implement it and to recognize there are things out there that really do work for kids, that really do have an impact and how come we can't jump on those kind of things. We know, for example, that early intervention has a tremendous impact on children's development. 
not only for the skills that they would need, but also for the mediation of trauma they might be exposed to. Lack of language. Do you know, for example, children who come from families of poverty, by the time they're five years of age, are exposed to about one million words. Children who are born to middle class parents, and by the time they're five years, are exposed to 25 million different words. I'm not saying they understand them all or use them, but the exposure part of it. What does that tell you? The idea that poverty doesn't matter. George Bush told us in the excellent commission of education, everybody was going to be normal by what, 2014, I think. Hey, that's this year, isn't it? Yeah. Here's my synopsis of that. How about everybody in Congress be normal by 2014? <laughs> the bell-shaped curve is alive and well. The fact that poverty does have, doesn't have implications on instructional learning, or the fact that you come from a different culture or a different country, you don't think that matters? Anybody here ever been in a foreign country and felt comfortable immediately if you didn't know the language? I have a school it, where I'm from. When I first came 40 years ago, we literally, in, a, in an article in a national news magazine, said that Wausau, Wisconsin was the whitest city in America. We had no diversity. Fast forward 40 years later, we speak 40-some different languages in our schools. I have one of my schools that has a 44% Hispanic population. They don't speak any English. How do, you, how, how, how do you take into account those kind of issues? Blaming teachers for not teaching kids? No, it's about understanding what works for these kids. How do we d differentiate that? So what, what, do we, what can we build on? Well, let's, let's, let's look at a couple of things that the research tells us. Uh, identify what matters most. Turns out more than half of U.S. children report to have one or more risk factors for school fare with 15% having three or more. Hattie did a meta-analysis of 61 aptitude treatment interaction, indicates grouping students according to ability and providing with them stroke and appropriate instructional support provide more benefit to higher achieving students than to lower achieving students. Turns out he also went on to say that if you do the lining instruction, the learning styles are only slightly above what would be expected. There's considerable overlap to individual learning styles. How many people here were bought into that crap where you know you're a visual learner, you're an auditory learner and all that stuff? Man, you learn. Now think about that for a minute. We talk about that. Or how about anybody here old enough to remember when we used to group kids by intellectual capacity? I went through that. I went through it. I don't know how it happened, but I will tell you, they put me in the fastest track. In sixth grade, they evaluate you. And then they put you in a track, and when you get to junior high school, that's what we used to call it, middle school, junior high. Fast track. We had 16 tracks. If you were in track number one, life was going to be good for you. You were exposed to language and all sorts of different opportunities. You learned to speak Latin and French or whatever it might be. Kids who were in track 16 barely got out of the, the woodworking class. You know what I'm saying? They never were exposed to anything. But you know what we found out in those years? We found out that there were really average smart kids. There were smart, smart kids. And there was very dumb smart kids. The bell-shaped curve was alive and well across all of those spectrums. We were learned out re really very quickly that instruction is enhanced not by the teacher, but how you set up the classroom. We now know, for example, pods are a better way to provide instruction. Two on two facing so the kids can interact with things instead of having them in rows. The point is, is there are things that we can control that affect children's development. We need to recognize that the school level variable, the strongest and parent link to success, is the opportunity to learn. Do you know, on average, statistically, and if you don't believe me, clock it in your own schools. From an eight hour day, kids are in instructional activities about two and a half hours out of an eight hour day. The rest are transitions, the rest are waiting in lines, the rest are not engaging in instruction. Two and a half hours, and people say we have no time. That's just not true. The reality simply is how do we use our time? As Cliff Vane, anybody ever heard of Cliff Vane? Probably not, he was my high school phi ed teacher. He said, you need to make time to have time to work out. And we thought he was the dumbest man in America. And now, 40 years later, he is the smartest. You make time to things that are important. Isn't that right? Engaged instructional time. And although we know that more time is not the only answer, it's engaged time. And I'm going to talk to you about that in terms of the tiers and how that works. Insulation from evidence. Let's go on paying attention. Insulation from evidence virtually guarantees a never-ending supply of policy and practice fatally independent of reality. Alternate ways of knowing that, especially those based on your own experience, are often preferred because it's the only knowable reality. Take a look, if you will, at page 8. Educational decisions without an empirical foundation become ideological debates that represent what Saul told us in 95, a conflict of vision. Vision 
about systems thinking ends up painting lovely pictures of the future with no deep understanding of the forces that must be mastered from, to move from here to there. Think about this. Special education was designed to provide individualized instruction for kids who had discrete needs that needed intensive type of special skills. Isn't that right? And now we know that in some states there's 17 to 24 percent of children who are identified as disabled. We know that the response to movement instruction model is part of the whole idea that we've over identified kids who are learning disabled. Would you agree with that? And the question really is, is it a result of poor instruction, lack of adequate opportunity, is it poverty, whatever it might be. The fact of the matter is simply is this, is that these policy debates that we have without really understanding that we've had this parallel path as because we've never taken the time to understand regular education. Regular education is its own institution, its own way of doing things, and it has its own problems that have to be solved on regular ed terms. We can no longer think that kids who have differential needs are the responsibility of specialized people. It never made any sense. Why? How many people here have been in special education maybe, let's say, 15 years? Anybody? Great. Do you remember the model? We would take a kid who had a learning problem out and we would provide a plan for them that would individualize their instruction and we would be pretty successful in many cases and then we'd want to reintegrate that kid into the general curriculum and we couldn't do it. And the reason was is because we didn't teach them the curriculum that everybody else was learning. There was this, this sort of uh, differentiation that just was never going to happen. And you have to think to yourself, let's, let's just talk about the process for special ed for just a minute. Tell me if this is not the way we do it. Kid is referred through a gatekeeping process, okay? This is prior to RTI and all this, and we're still kind of in this in many states, but kid is referred for special education. Someone thinks something is wrong. You follow me on this? And it's usually when? About third grade, isn't it right? Usually too late, right? The, the water's under the bridge, the cat's out of the bag, the horse is out of the barn. Do you talk like that in Indianapolis? <laughs> no, I didn't think you did. You have lost Peyton Manning, excuse me. Oh, sorry, I just had a little fun with that, you know. Yeah, yeah. Anyhow. <laughs> um, so we make a referral. Then we do an evaluation with tests that are not necessarily valid or reliable for what they're supposed to be. And then we identify and place these kids in categories that could change from district to district or state to state. You could be learning disabled in, in, in Indiana and come to Wisconsin and you don't qualify. Isn't that right? But then we also tell parents, we say, and by the way, we'd really like your child to stay in special education because we have an inclusive model here that we want all kids to be part of the regular ed curriculum. So we go through all this crap to end up in the same place. Does that make sense to anybody in this room? No. How do you defend that? So if you think back and you took a look at Bergen's work and Mackey's work and you say to yourself, how come people didn't buy into this concept before? If a kid doesn't know the alphabetic principle, who in this room don't think we should teach it to them, right? Why, why did that happen? It's because we didn't understand the regular education institution. We now know, for example, in many states we're providing services, and I don't know if your state does, but in Wisconsin we have all-day kindergarten. We have 4K programs where kids come to school. We have birth to three programs. We recognize now that if we can inoculate kids against trauma, the way we're going to do them is expose them to an environment that more than likely will change the effect of what can happen at home. We can't undo what mom and dad might expose a kid to or the environment, but what we can do is steal the kid up for what they're going to be exposed to. And part of that is providing instruction and understanding what regular ed is all about. There's need to be a partnership here that we never really did, uh, I think, answer. And if you take a look if on the bottom of page 8, and I think this is a nice statement by Fuchs and others, Collaboration and shared responsibility across general and special education requires a seismic shift in beliefs, attitudes, and practices. We have to respect the reality. If you turn to the top of page 9, that is a value judgment, is it not? Now think about this for just a minute. Why did we become so in love with categorization? Why did we think that a shortcut to place kids someplace else to provide them instruction they needed was going to be a better model for instruction. Why didn't we think that all kids could learn, but they learn at different levels, they learn at different speeds? Why, why, why was that not really a prominent discussion? Because we never really had the conversations with the people that actually teach the class. 
Think about this. Any regular ed teachers in here today? Think about this. If I have one special needs child, and I don't need spe just special ed, but somebody who's a tough kid academically or behaviorally, if you just have one and you complain about that, you know that's a little overblown, wouldn't you agree? But if you have two or three kids who have special needs and you still have to focus and you're going to be held accountable by the way how your whole class performs, as you add the numbers, as they increase arithmetically, the needs expand exponentially, isn't that right? And so when a classroom teacher says, I can't do that, they're not saying they don't want to do it, they're saying, I can't do it. But what do we hear oftentimes? I don't want to do it because the way it might be presented is not right, because we've never taken the time to understand that process. Let's talk about how that's trying to be uncovered and focused on some of the things that are happening on a national level. There's a great little parable, and I listed his teacher effect is real and is statistically demonstrable, and it's well illustrated in this parable. And here's how it is: this guy's in this, walking by this stream or this river, and all of a sudden he sees a baby floating down in a basket, and he looks, oh my God, you know that's just not right. So he gets in the water and he takes the baby out in the basket and he puts him on the ground. And as soon as he does that, he sees another basket and he sees another's. And finally neighbors come around and people try to help him. And pretty soon people get out of the water and they start walking away. And the guy said, well, why are you leaving me? Because they want to find out who's throwing the babies in. And it's a whole different dynamic. If you think of instruction, think about when kids come to school at three or four and don't have the skill set necessary to meet the environment. And we put them in a rule governed process that they're not used to, that they've never been exposed to. Think about this, if you will, for just a minute. For those of you that have, how many child, people have children of their own? You know what? Uh, tell me if this is not true. If you're an educator, you read to your kids, do you not? You expose them to all sorts of things, don't you? You work on language. I have a brand new grandson, my first one. Cutest damn thing that you ever saw, by the way. Three months old, he's already talking. It's unbelievable. I mean, I don't know if it's true, but I think he's talking because I say to him, Merry Christmas, even when it's not Christmas, and he coos back at me. I, I think he's saying something to me, you know what I'm saying? And my daughter sent me a picture of him yesterday, and he was dreaming, and she says, he's thinking of you. And I, I like that kind of thing. The reason I'm saying this is that my kids, our kids, are exposed to language. They're exposed to things. We're going to do that. Imagine the kid... There's no book at home. There's no access to that stuff. They see the wrong things. They're exposed to things that take away from them. And then we bring them in and we say that the playing field is level. Is that really true? No, it's not. So it's not about not knowing that. It's about the attitude, isn't it? It's perspective. It's about how we bring it. Let me, let me tell you a story. Um, attitude is about everything we do, isn't that right? And uh, today I could have been very angry the way things were not going well and I, I got on the verge of it, but what really broke the ice was that after I was delayed for almost another hour and 50 minutes and think I'm never going to make it to Detroit, we're getting ready to leave and somebody was in the bathroom in the back of the plane and the lady said, sorry, we can't go until this person is out of the bathroom. And you got to think to yourself, you know, couldn't you have gone to the bathroom another time? <laughs> and then on the other hand, how many people here have ever had to go to the bathroom sometime that wasn't convenient? you got to give them some license, you know what I'm saying? And I started to laugh to myself, and it completely changed the way I felt about this trip. And I decided I was going to get to Detroit, and if I could make my flight, great. If I didn't, I would spend all day in Detroit and then fly home tonight, which would have been very non-productive, and you would have enjoyed this wonderful afternoon, and it would have been sad for all of us. But nonetheless, I stuck it out in its attitude, and I want to tell you this story. Some years ago, I was flying through Chicago O'Hare Airport. If you've ever have a chance to go to Chicago, I recommend you don't. Okay, <laughs> But here I am and I was delayed and I was just, what, so many times I was delayed and I was really kind of down in the drums and so I decided, you know, I'm going to try to game the system so I looked for a sky cap. I figured if I could get a sky cap maybe I could kind of go around the system and everybody else was waiting in lines to the ticket counter so I wandered around the bowels of Chicago Airport, O'Hare Airport and I finally find a sky cap and there's two or three people in front of me. I'm just kind of minding my own business waiting for my turn and there's a guy in front of the line that is clearly mad, he's clearly been bumped from something and has a right to be angry, but his approach to it and his anger was very unwarranted. And he was screaming and hollering at the sky cap in such a manner as a highly trained psychologist with the ability to de-escalate a crisis situation and give him a moment, I thought I should intervene and <laughs> pop the guy myself. That's what I was thinking <laughs> of doing. But the whole time, the louder this man became, the more derogatory he was, the more offensive he was, the calmer the skycap was. 
I have to tell you, it was textbook perfect. Anybody here ever been trained in CPI or MANT training system? You know, they tell you how you got to maintain your cool, all the kids spitting in your face, and you know, just be smiling at them. A little hard to do, isn't it? This guy kept, excuse me, <clears throat> was, yeah, I mean, honestly, I would have wished I could have videotaped it. This was well before you had all these technology things. So he calms the guy down, sends the guy off. My turn. I get up there and he's doing my bag. And I said to him, sir, I got to tell you, first of all, I want to apologize to you for that previous man's behavior. I said, nobody has to tolerate it, but I'll tell you, you were outstanding. The guy looks at me like I'm a nut. Okay, and he says, well, thank you. That was very kind of you. Uh, I appreciate that. And I said, well, uh, yeah, I just appreciate it. But I said, by the way, I, w I, I do a training on how to deal with difficult people and collaboration. And I'm just wondering, have you been through some specialized training program? Because I'd like to be able to share that with people that I work with. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, like in education, when we have kids with behavior, we do CPI or the man training system. We have all sorts of different ways to teach teachers new skills to work with people. He said, no, we don't have anything like that with United Airlines. I said, really? And I said, well, how come you're so good at what you do? And he looks at me and he says, you know what? I get paid to do this job. And whoever comes here, it's my job to make their day. What? I'm thinking to myself, I'm thinking, Wow, but I'm also thinking, this is America. We're a bunch of whiners and complainers, isn't that right? And I said to him, I said, sir, I appreciate that, and I, and I, I said, I don't mean to be persistent. He said, but you are. <laughs> and I, said, I, I said, yes, I am, but I said, I just really want to know, and I'd like to share with other people. I said, oh, he said, even if I told you, you couldn't tell anybody. And then I said to him, well, I'm a psychologist. How about if I did it in a counseling situation with confidentiality issues? He said, well, I think that would be okay. And he said, and, and he, and so I said, so how do you do it? How do you maintain this attitude? He said, well, that guy uh, is on his way to, to, uh, to Ohio, and I've sent his bags to Tokyo. <laughs> the sign of ability of maturity is the ability to delay gratification. Isn't that not a dish? A, a revenge is a dish best served cold. Are you right with that? My point is this. I think sometimes we've personalized some things and conflict when we've allowed the negativity to overshadow really what the problem was. When it comes to instructional integrity, doesn't everybody want kids to do well? Right? But how can we have these parallel discussions? It's because we let the anger and the frustration take over for the fact that the pe people that we want to work collaboratively with don't have the skills necessary to do what we want them to do. So. We need to teach a problem-solving way. If you take a look at nine, and again, this is a quick walk around the block. If you take a look at a page nine, there's three ways to respond to an intervention. One is the discrepancy approach, where basically, you know, it's a difference between pre- and post-intervention levels of performance. Treatment ability is the degree which any assessment contributes to the outcome. Applied behavioral analysis approaches I find quite intriguing. Page 10, middle of the page, five functional reasons that kids struggle. They don't want to do it. That's a performance deficit issue. They, number two, they don't have the opportunity to do lack of practice and feedback. Number three, they have not had enough help to do the skill, skill deficit. They don't, haven't had to do it. Instructional demands do not promote mastery. How many times have we heard that one? And they find it too hard. There's a poor match between the skill level and instructional levels. That's the applied behavior analysis approach. The difference is that it's a functional, rather, a structural explanation of why kids struggle. And then finally, the linear analysis approach, which is best described by the little graph that I put to you on the abscissus and the x and y axis on page uh, 11. Basically the level of consultation in teachers increases, the level of consultation with support people increases, and then the individual instruction problem solving is different by individual needs. The thinking, however, is the same through all of these models, and we're going to get to the intervention process in just a minute. The fact of the matter is two things have to be operationalized. What do you want a child to be doing and what are they actually doing? The difference between these measurements rep represent the problem, not the behavior that is subject to the problem uh, solving. Take a look, if you will, on page 12. Substantial pro professional judgment must be exercised when defining the problem. So how do we st determine the standard at which to judge a student's performance and how do we take into account all the variables they're going to be approaching that approach instructional integrity? As I said before, if you have one or two students in your classroom, you ought to be able to differentiate. When you have multiple students, arithmetically and exponentially, that's a different story. But the question in problem solving is this. We have to agree on what it is we're going to teach, all right? Now, I don't know about your state, but let's just, let's just laugh for a minute. 
Um, is everybody here 100% in, in, in alignment with the, the, the core standards that have been promoted? Is everybody happy and is life good and things are going okay with that? How can that be? If something is good to teach, wouldn't you think there would be more agreement than disagreement? Right? I mean, honestly, I said it earlier today, if you want to teach your children how to drive, there's, let's pretend there's a hundred things in sequence that they have to be taught. There should be some similarities between what all kids need to know in order to be driving effectively. Isn't that true? So the core is a concern, isn't it? We have philosophical difference. I don't know if you ever follow Wisconsin, but we have a governor that has decimated um, the teacher population in, in our schools, has created huge morale problems, and now he's decided uh, and taken money away from funding education, but he's decided he now wants to raise the bar even more than the core. He thinks he knows more about instructional involvement than teachers and educators and knowledgeable people. I mean no disrespect by this, but he doesn't. And, um, and it's funny because what it's done is it's take the focus off really what's important. And that is, is that shouldn't we be able to at least come to some common understanding of what it is we want to teach we, you know, for the most part, and the fringes can be over here. I don't mean that there aren't going to be disagreements. But then to recognize that what we do is define what we teach in a linear dimensional fashion, just like that blueprint for change that was listed back, back in the 60s by Mackey. And then we say measure kids on that continuum and then no longer worry how come they're only at this level. This is where the problem solving model is so appropriate. Here's the educational curriculum or criteria this is where the kid is on the criteria. This is where we want them to be. How they only got this far to begin with is no longer important. Etiology is not critical. It doesn't matter if you have a learning problem or if you're cognitively delayed or you have behavioral physical problems. The content of instruction never changes. What changes is where are they at on that continuum and what do you need to do to change that? Would you agree with that? How many people here um, uh, have to, well, you all have taken uh, graduate courses, isn't that true? Um, and let me give you an a, a interesting story. I, um, I love statistics. I like to look at data, you know, the, the sigma and the mu and all that stuff. Those are words that just float through my head at nighttime when I'm dreaming. I love that kind of stuff. And um, I teach for the university from time to time in graduate courses, and they asked me to do a non-traditional statistics course. Now, I'm thinking eight to ten highly motivated clinicians that really want to know statistics, right? We're going to do it for 40 hours in a row. This is just stuff that I'm excited about. 62 people show up the first day. And I realize right away they aren't lovely engaged practitioners. These are people that have left statistics for their last class for their master's degree or their doctorate, okay? And they don't want to be there. Okay, so I have a choice. I'm either going to teach them what I think they need to know and then those that don't get it it's their fault or I need to think if I'm going to do this for 40 hours I have to engage them in some fashion in some way so I have to differentiate I have to have tiers we never called it that but I have to have different levels isn't that right I mean there's certain levels of variability that everybody needs to know central tendency all those things are very important criteria but inferential analysis is something that's a bit more sophisticated and may not be required for everybody my point is simply this in a short problem solving process is that the criteria was already laid out. We knew what we were going to teach. The question is, where did you fall on the continuum? Not how come you didn't fall higher or lower, but what were you going to do? So you're right here, and what am I going to do now? I no longer worried about what the name was or why they didn't have it or why they weren't interested. It was what we were going to do instructionally. Does that make sense to you? Good. So then we go, that, and you're going to see where this is going to come on the tiers in just a minute. Take a look for page 12. Just highlighted a couple things from the Office of Special Education. As you well know, response to instruction, and I don't know in your state, I should, I should have read your statutes uh, before I came, but do you have, uh, for you identifying kids with learning disabilities, is this part of the model you must use in order to determine whether kids are learning disabled? And it only applies to learning disabled or referral or kids that are struggling in school. It's not a model used across all disability categories. Am I right on that? Okay, good. Some people are kind of taking this model and going all over, and there's some good to that. I'm just suggesting that it started here. And basically, if you take a look at this, um, a multiple tiers, progressively more intense research-based instruction, and a fifth core, fidelity of measures. Turn, if you will, to page 13. 
We know it's systematic, database-driven system for instructional decision making. Includes a problem-solving method with Bergen and Evers uh, and the Mackey told us way in the back. And it talks about a differentiated classroom. And here's the thing that's rubbed. Did you know that most current teachers have never been a student in one? To all of you young people in here today, you've never been in a differentiated classroom. Most of you are, are have actually seen one. Turns out that many teachers indicate they believe in differentiation. They indicate, the, however, that they don't think it's possible to do it. Teachers seldom differentiate instruction. Few teachers instruct in ways that are culturally and racially sensitive. Turns out when they do differentiate, turn to the top of page 14, they do so in ways that are more tangential than sub substantive, in ways that are more reactive than proactive. Let me give you a couple concrete examples. One of the simplest things what we do that, that variable we control is time. And it turns out that people think that if you give more time to the same task that, that will do the kid will do better. Well, time is a variable for instruction, but it's got to be academic engaged time. It can't just be more time. What do we know about school retention? If you do kindergarten over two times, does that mean you're going to be better at it because you've had twice as much kindergarten as everybody else? Here's a better question. How come you struggled the first time? What would we change so you're not continuing to struggle? And what skills do you need to have in order to go to the next level? Those are better questions to have instead of saying, kid's not mature enough. They didn't acquire enough skills. Let's just push them through it again. Imagine if you taught somebody swimming with that same model. You taught them only what you thought they were going to be exposed to and they didn't get it and you just put them out in a big pond and said, have a good day. You know what I mean? Not very productive. There's an old story, you know, where the kid, kid is, father takes the kid in a rowboat out into the middle of the lake and throws him into the lake and the kid flounders for a little bit and struggles and finally kind of, you know, gets his rhythm and you know, and, and, and finally gets above the head, head above the water after gasping and swallowing all this water. And he finally swims over to the boat and slowly gets up inside the boat and looks at his dad and says, Dad, I can't tell you much. I appreciate that. That was an odd way to teach me, but it was a good way for me to be responsible. And he said, well, I wasn't trying to teach you how to swim. <laughs> Don't you get it? He, he th threw him in there. It's a dark story. It's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. <laughs> and I haven't even had my Mountain Dew. Should I explain that one more time? Did I do that bad of a job? I remember what I told you before. You gotta, you gotta laugh at that. Th Never mind. Okay, I missed that completely. Yeah, you get it on the way home. Okay. Well, I, I want you to look at paragraph number six. Uh, oh, by, by the way, even teachers in special classes, by the way, have a difficult di time differentiating, which is kind of a surprise. But let's see what Walker said. He went on to say in 2000, increasingly professional practices are guided as much by self-generated knowledge and reflection values and advocacy as empirically derived outcomes and findings. <laughs> and why is that? Uh-oh, here's the answer. Professionals use intervention, that's you, that's me, when those interventions make teaching easier. That's good, right? Two, do not involve a lot of extra work, oops, are relatively easy to understand and for those administrators in the room are inexpensive. Wow, really? That shouldn't really be the calling card, should it? I mean, honestly, think about anything in your life that was important. If you got it for free and it worked and you didn't have to work at it, it didn't have the same level of meaning for you, did it? The fact of the matter, this is sort of counterintuitive common sense. Well, my point simply is this, is that we have to be it's recognizing that much of the way that we have taught kids with learning problems and behavioral issues is reactive rather than proactive. So, response to instruction, the RTI model is about what? Making sure that you understand what it is you're going to teach, and I'm simplifying this by a long shot, okay, but I just would like to talk that way. Simplifying what it is you teach, monitor the progress of those skills based on the instructional things you use that are evidenced or research-based, correct? And then changing your way of instruction if it doesn't work. But turns out that we keep doing things even when it doesn't work. And teachers are more likely to believe what they believe than what the data is telling them. I have been in many conversations where I've told people that the data says this kid is struggling in your class and the teacher will say, no, there are not. How do, you, how do you refute that? So the fact of the matter is we need to be able to recognize that we need to understand that data is a very important part of what we do. Everybody in here uses data and I know you're probably tired of hearing that, but the reality is if you want to 
save money, you want to lose weight, you want to change your diet, you have to establish a baseline. You've got to monitor whether or not you're uh, acquiring the skills you expect them to acquire. And you need to do it in a different fashion, a different way. So, how do we go through the tiers? This is the tiers without tiers part. Turn to page 14, bottom. Specificity and intensity, distinguishing among tiers. How many people are using a four tier model or a three tier? How many are doing three tier? How many are doing four tier? How many think that when you get to the top tier, the third tier, you're in special education? Is that your model in this state? It's not under the original process of RTI, but the reality simply is it's just a different way of providing instruction, but special ed is not in tier three. But there are some states, some people that think that. Um, what differentiates the tiers? Size of the instructional group. Okay, you got 20 kids. We have SAGE classes in our schools that kids, you can't have more than 15 children in a classroom. Isn't that great? What's the average caseload in your state? Anybody know? In Oregon, it's 46. Elementary. High school is higher. You don't believe it, look it up. Any, anybody wonder what it would be like teaching 46 kids? Be hard to do, wouldn't it? Right? What is the average caseload for an elementary teacher in this state? 25 to 30. Is that manageable? Depends on the kids, doesn't it? Absolutely, it does. Good deal, okay? Size and intensity of the instructional group. Immediacy of corrective feedback. Mastery requirements. Amount of time. Take a look at page 15. This came from an article by Perry Zerkel, by the way, which outlined what different states are doing in the tiers. Number of transitions about content and classes, specificity of setting goals, duration of the intervention, weeks versus months versus days, frequency, amount of time, instructor skill level. Those are things that are left up to you subjectively but can be quantified. There is no magic way to move from one tier to the other. And if you've seen a mathematical performer that allows you to do that, it's bogus. It does not work. There's no possible way that you can say this kid is at this tier and you move down to here under some mathematical formula. It has to do to some level of the instructional things that you have complete control over the variables. <coughs> what about the duration of the intervention? Turns out provisions tend toward variety and latitude rather than in uniformity. Turns out there's a range and number of weeks for the duration of an activity. How long is long enough? How long is it long enough before you decide it's not working? How do you know when you've done what you could and it's not being done? What are the variables that enter into that? How could it be just a, uh, like you have to do something for two weeks? Does fidelity have anything to do with that? Well, absolutely it does, does it not? Um, does it, how, how about engage time? I don't know about you guys, we've missed um, um, some of our schools five days already in this month of school. What about consistency? Anybody read on any other research of what happens to kids when they quit school in May and what happens to them when they start school in September? How many people here use MAP testing, measures of academic progress? Anybody uses that? No kidding? Wow, you got to get hot on that. MAP, Descartes, all that? Oh man, unbelievable. It's a graded process that, uh, it, it's one of those assessment processes that's academically oriented based on the standard co common core that actually the kid answers a hard question, they give them a harder one. Answer an easy, if they can't answer the question, it gives them an easier one and you get what's called a RIT score. So you can decide where your children are in terms of the criteria that you're teaching. A great measurement, but what it does is it tells you and differentiates kids who are high performers, who kids are moving towards the mean. It data and analyzes performance of academic requirement. It's NWA puts it out, if you're not, National Wisconsin, uh, National, um, NWA, what does that stand for? Uh, National Education something um, Research. It's, oh, whoa, man. But it's NWEA. NWEA and MAP, it's called Measures of Academic Performance, MAP, from about second grade to 12th grade. It measures children on a criteria in a continuum and exactly tells you where they are. And the reason I'm measuring and telling you about MAP is this. We find that when kids are evaluated in the spring, and then they're evaluated in winter, and then from winter to spring we see a decrease in instruction. And we don't know why. And it turns out it's throughout the, the standardization sample. So what occurs from January to May? Well, could it be we're less enthusiastic? Could we be on the end of the trail? We're losing our, our energy, our drive. Could it be the weather? Could it be, you know, all these kind of things. And it turns out, interestingly enough, that the conversations are never had. What happens is that the scores are, 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 are gathered, but people never have discourse about what's going good and what's going bad. 
the duration intervention has a lot to do with problem solving and understanding how kids are performing. Finally, criteria for frequency, and it turns out this came from a research article in Perry Zerkel. Here's in tier one, approximately 90 minutes or a range of 60 to 180 minutes on a daily basis. That's a direct instruction in a content area. Some of you have probably read the latest research on math, and we now know that children that do not succeed in math are probably more likely to have problems in real life after you graduate, excuse me, than kids who have reading problems. So reading and reading has always been our major focus. Math has been kind of the weak cousin, isn't that true? It turned out that's probably a bad model. So we're talking about increasing the likelihood and the sensitivity of that sensitivity. Tier two add in. Really, intensity and frequency, 30 minutes to five times, three to five times a week. So you continue. In addition, by the way, when you move to the next tier, this is an add-on. This is not, I mean, this is an addition to. Uh, considerable variation, and again, predominantly via recommendation rather than requirement. There is no requirement for how that tier is supposed to look, but that's generally how the practice is in terms of time. We're going to talk about time again because I mentioned that's not the only answer. And tier three is intensity an additional 30 to 60 minutes, uh, four to five times a week rather than three to five or the regular core, but the, but the same uh, uh, lack of stringency and uniformity is evident throughout the national level. This basically says that you can go from state to state and there is no uniform way for people to differentiate between what is a core instructional level or what is a tier two or what is a tier three level. What about progress monitoring? Kind of an interesting thing. Frequency of groups, most have addressed the first, but few states have addressed the second. That is decision rules. How do you move from tier to tier? Um, progress monitoring, talk about the importance of screening. Do you screen for, uh, for the three stool uh, chair here? Do you do reading screening? At what age levels? All grade levels? So do you have a screening instrument that kids who are 4K kindergarten, do you have 4K programs in Indiana? Do you have kindergarten all day? Okay. So you screen children for, do you use dibbles or pals or something, dibbles? Okay, good, dibbles a great thing, nice progress monitoring. Our state decided to use pals, which has been a good instructional tool for kids. Uh, it has to do with something, uh, blah, blah, literacy. Uh, <laughs> PA, I forget, but it's called pals. You can look it up in the thing and I can give you the site if you email me, but we use that. But it doesn't have a progress monitoring tool, but teachers believe that it gives them better data about the specific skills kids are missing, like phonemic awareness, alphabetic principle. Um, behavior, I developed a behavior rating skill called the BEST, bestuniversalscreening.com, um, and math, easy CBM math. Uh, there's a number of different programs, so the point is there has to be some way to screen children. Frequency of progress monitoring is b determined by bi-monthly or weekly. How do you monitor progress in children? How do you know they're do going along the path you expect them to do? And recognize that at tier three, it's frequent monitoring. So what are the tiers without the tiers? And there's a couple basic things here, and I wanted to put it in a question format, and then I'm going to give you an example of the live binder. First of all, the core universal instructional support. In, in about 80 to 85 percent of your children are going to be in core. Would you agree with that? And that, you need to know that if that's true by doing what? You've got to measure it. You've got to know that. You can't just assume that that's correct in your district because it may not be. You may be a bimodal distribution. You may be a, have high levels of uh, cultural differences. You need, to, you need to recognize your core may be different than other people's core. But what is the core? It's implementing well searched practices. It's effective for at least 80% of the students are meeting benchmark. And it begins with clear goals. And there's four questions that you have to ask and one and two are the ones that are related to making the core more visible first of all what do you want your kids to learn in the content area whatever it might be and we go back to the whole whoa go back to the whole system that says what it is that we want kids to be taught number two how will we know if and when they've learned it what do you what is the de demonstrable data that you're collecting to show that the kid has the skill and can generalize it and use it number three what do we do if the kids don't learn it in the core? What are the things that we're doing? And that's the thing that we can change the context, the instruction, the peers, the, the way we form their classrooms, the many, many alternatives. And I'll give you an example in just a minute. And then finally, how will we respond when some students have already learned? How are we going to move them along? Question one and two, guarantee the viable core curriculum. Target two is supplemental interventions. This is for about 20% of the students, and this is an addition. This is effective for at least 70 to 80% of the students to improve performance, and the gap towards the benchmark is the goal. 
keep in mind, and this is a difficult thing, how many people here are familiar with how statistics work? If you have a group of people and I test you before I teach you anything, we're going to have a lower average. Would you agree with that? And then if I teach you something and I teach you well, we're going to have a higher average. Wouldn't that be true? And there are going to be some dispersion. And we call that the standard deviation from the mean. That's the average difference between the mean score and the score that the person has, right? So the question really is, is that when we have a large standard deviation, we know we're missing more kids. Wouldn't that be true? And if we have a very small standard deviation, we know that we've got a very hardcore process. So the question here that you ask yourself, that how, how, what, where the, what are the students performing now and how are we going to monitor that? Where do we want them to be and how long, and this is the key, will it take to get them there? See the difference? When I was teaching the statistics course, 10 of them were way ahead of the game. A very large propensity of them were not. They were here. The question I had, I had till Friday. Now that's certainly an artificial date. But how long would it take me to get them from they, where they were to where I would like them to be? Somewhere close to the average. Would you know what I mean? The place where we'd like them to be instructionally. And how long would it take? It might take you six weeks. It might take you two weeks. It might take you five weeks. It might take you a day. The point is, is that's where we have to make that prediction and that's individually student driven and not some kind of model that is applied to everyone. Um, how much do they have to grow per month per year? And the growth thing is an interesting model. And if you look at, at the different growth models, percent of growth is basically pre, post, test, subtract the pre from the post, divide it by the beginning, determine the percent of growth and determine if the kid has moved. So what I would do is I'd take your score in whatever I decided I was going to teach in the, the statistics. I'd take that score and then I would teach and then I would measure you at the end of the time and I would take the new score minus the first score, take the result of that divided by the first score and I get the percentage of growth. That's more important to me than the average, is it not? I want to know are you growing, right? Are you learning a new skill? So that happens at tier two in my opinion and that's a prediction that you need to make. How do you know how long it takes? I guess it's one of those questions that that is not really answerable, is it, in many ways. And then finally you go to tier three. And this is intensive individualized support, increased time, narrow focus, very reduced group size, by the way, far more instructional integrity than any other level. Same content, but delivered in different differential ways. And designed to teach intensive marks. And again, same kind of questions, but, the, but number question number four is probably more important in this stage and that is what supports have been provided and why is that critical? Because you want to know what you've tried that didn't work, isn't that right? You don't want to do more of the same because that's not going to be very productive. And then finally you want to be able to achieve, achieve uh, close the gap. And keep in mind that when you measure children the gap can continue to grow, isn't it? Because what happens is that you change the skills are learning. So if I taught you some statistics and you got good at it and I keep teaching you the gap is going to get bigger if I don't do something for the kids that are struggling over here. You keep going this way, the mean or the average, and this kid stays stagnant, doesn't even have to move, but, but the difference here is, is larger and larger. So if you turn to Appendix A, what I've done, I believe, is giving you a very nice visual of an upside down pyramid again that gives you some things and ideas of what you might be doing to address those different the core instruction, supplemental instruction, intensive instruction. But I will say to you and I want to be very clear about this, while you identify kids into these categorical areas, it's not about keeping them in one or the other, it's about how you're going to provide instruction. Does that make sense to everybody? It's what you're going to do that's different. Now let's talk about engaged time. Has anybody here ever wanted to learn a thing and if you, if you were given 100 hours you could never learn it? Right? And, and, and it was never going to happen, isn't that right? I mean, I play basketball in the morning at the YMCA at 4 o'clock with a bunch of old guys, okay? I'd like to be able to dunk a basketball. <laughs> what do you think the chances are of me ever doing that? Well, you don't have to be quite obvious that, I mean, she's, just, she's, she's going like this, oh, that ain't, that ain't going to happen, yeah. No, uh, the point is, it's not going to happen, right? So it wouldn't matter how much time you put into it, it's not going to make a difference. So the question really is, is that the right goal for, or, for me? And that's the same thing I think we have to evaluate. I will tell you this, and, I, and you may have a different opinion. 
I believe the bell-shaped curve is going to continue to be alive and well. And I think when we start to look at that criterion, there are going to be people, kids, that in, are in certain categories. And we're not interested, we were interested in closing the gap, yes. But what we are interested in mostly is what? Growth. I mean, even if I couldn't dunk the basketball, maybe I jump two inches the first time and then I build my legs up and now I'm jumping four inches or something, if it's still that important, you know? There's some level of growth that is occurring that's positive and proactive and is moving towards where you want the kid to be. Remember, the continuum, you don't want the kid here, this is, bless you, this is where you want him to be, where's the kid on that continuum? I think that little upside down pyramid is great. Now, what I want you to think about before we end is this whole collaborative view of how this process is supposed to work. So if you would take a look at page 19, I think the qualities that we talk about, and I'm going to give you this live binder thing, is an inner pressure to achieve results, which I think we are recognizing we have to do something different, but also a high level of confidence in your own abilities. And I believe that's the part of the puzzle that we're missing, <laughs> is the ability to recognize that teachers have to have a forum to be able to say unequivocally, without evaluative measures, to say, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to teach that skill. I don't know how to modify it. I need to differentiate it. And they ought to be able to say it boldly and explicitly without being evaluated in a negative way. We have to create a level, a playing field for children, to, and ad, I mean adults, to talk about the skills that they have and the skills that they need so that we can change the way we provide instruction. If you look at the bottom of, uh, 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 bottom of page 19 and the top of page, the whole idea of instructional hangover shows you that 28 to 56 percent of the time is actually spent in instruction. There's a larger relationship between academic learning time and achievement and if you take a look at the top of page 20, and this is a critical aspect of where I want to go with my learning binder, although time does matter, it's not the amount of time that's spent during a child's degree of learning, but how engaged they are. Minutes are finite, Loss of minutes, loss of achievement, minutes are the currency we use for instruction. Madeline Hunter said, time is the coin of teaching that we need to spend wisely. Isn't that a good one? It means that, think about it, when you start to look at these tiers in instruction, the content should be clear. The process for instruction should be evidence-based. Monitoring the progress by using growth models is an essential part of what we do recognizing that we don't need more time, we just have to use the time that we have more efficiently. And the way we do that is helping teachers. If you turn to page 21, look at some of Anita Archer's work on explicit teaching instruction, by the way, some great hands-on stuff. We created um, a model here, and I've got two little references for you. One is called interventioncentral.org, and if you've never been on it, you need to. Jim Wright's done an excellent job, and a lot of resources available all across the board. But I want to give you an example. If you go on, uh, when you get home, go on this live binder site, and this is our live binder in Marathon County, and we are just in the draft, final draft stages. Um, we got lots to put on there, and you can use this binder access key, 10 or 11. And here's what we did. We thought, originally, we were going to create a binder, put all our interventions together, which we've been working on, and we put a hard copy and give it to every teacher, and we can say, good, now every kid's going to learn. Bad idea, bad model. First of all, it doesn't get the information to the hands of the people that need it. And secondly, it, do, it doesn't live. It, it doesn't grow with things. So what we've created is Live Binder, which is basically a process that you can click on it and say, like, behavior, for example. You can go on behavior and it'll pull down an ABC uh, rating chart for functional analysis. Or if you want to know about phonemic awareness, you go into reading and it'll be a little tab and it says, here's five different resources for you. And then it'll line it up with a, um, uh, a link to an instructional model that you might want to use or a resource that's automatically available to you. And here's what we think. We think in order for this to really work, to really bring it to, we need to do this for teachers. We need to interview you and ask you what you need, and then we need to work collaboratively with you on the live binder to show you how to differentiate your instruction by the different methodology that is evidence-based that is on this process. Designed, designed by the way, to work on individual kids, not as a group, not as a, some kind of cookbook approach. We think that the tears in all of that is an insurmountable discussion that will be philosophically burned in hell. It is never going to happen. 
So a better model was saying, decide what we want kids to learn, give teachers the skill necessary to teach all kids regardless of their skill set, and move them through growth models in a sy systematic and effective way. And that's what the live binder has done, and it's pretty cool. It's, again, it's nothing sophisticated, but I will tell you, we generated all these ideas from practitioners just like you, and you, it's just amazing how the different resources that are available and how, li well, how live it is. And I think what happens is classroom teachers want this. They want to know today. They don't want to wait three minutes, three weeks to get the answer. They want to be able to go on and find an answer that's meaningful and appropriate for them. Does that make sense to you? One last thought, simple model. Learning is on a continuum. Everybody can learn. Our job is to differentiate that so that it creates those opportunities. We're no longer interested in how a kid gets to a spot on that continuum, whatever the content is. We're interested in where do we want them to be and where are they right now and what are we going to do to get them there. What are the interventions we're going to use, what evidence-based practices, how we're going to monitor their progress, and what are we going to do so that they continue to grow and how are we going to know it when they did. And when they don't, are we going to be willing to change what it is we do? And that, my friends, will be a very difficult question to answer. So, wow, quick walk around the block. Was that helpful? Is it useful? Anything in there that you could use? I hope so. If you have any questions, please email me. Thank you for the opportunity for coming. I appreciate this. And uh, good luck to you and all the work that you do. Thanks.